Dr. Ruchika, if all is set, we may start round. Sure, sir. A very good morning to all our respected guests, Honorable Vice Chancellor, respected deans of all schools, dear faculties and all attendees. We extend our warmest welcome to our special guest today, Professor Nimit Chaudhary and Professor Manpreet Kaur, who are the keynote speakers of our conference. I hope you all are doing well. At the very outside, I would, outset, I would like to wish you all a very happy Women's Day. I, Ruchika, Assistant Professor of Sociology School of Liberal Arts, welcome you all on the behalf of IMS Nissan University for the conference which is titled Challenging the Status Quo, Gendered Empowerment and Change. We thank you all for joining us today and gracing us with your presence. I cannot think of a better way actually to mark this day other than promoting dialogue and reflections on the idea of gender and its intersections with other social access through this conference. International Women's Day is annually commenced to promote an equitable treatment of women long pending in the economic, political and social fields. This year, it marks 111 years since the first International Women's Day. The School of Hospitality Management and School of Liberal Arts aspire to share the responsibility by hosting this national interdisciplinary e-conference on gendered empowerment. The event shall provide a platform for researchers, practitioners, academicians and students to present their works, to share their works towards the mission. Gender equity is a global concern, but it requires the local to be addressed along with the global and specific in relation to the general. It deserves an inter interdisciplinary approach as it is related to the life politics beyond disciplinary boundaries. In line with this, the conference, this conference brings together scholarship on gender issues and women in the humanities, social sciences and natural sciences. It aims to explore historical and current issues in transformation pertaining to gender and social justice and critically examine methodological, academic as well as social concerns. We would like to begin today's conference with a short video on Vak Supta from Rig Veda. We refer to it as the Rig Vedic period was the golden period for the women of India. It not only granted economic, but political, social and intellectual freedom to its women, to its women folk, but also gave them full liberty to excel in the spiritual arena as well. Hence, it's not surprising that we have 27 women seers from the Rig Veda and allied literature. These Rishikas both composed and visualized by uh, by these rishikas. These Vedic hymns were composed by these rishikas. A close reading of these hymns reveals that these women seers were a group of articulate and spiritually enlightened women who were very well aware of their individualities. All of them display women power in their own right. The Vedic vision enshrined in the hymns can be significant for all the contemporary discussions today on the place of women in the society. We will play the video now. Yeah. 
Vak Sukta, as we saw, is a collection of hymns which upholds the power of speech, especially with respect to women. I think it has a considerable relevance in contemporary times and is significant for us to reflect upon with respect to the position of women in the Indian society. I would now request Professor Vinay Rana, Dean of School of Hospitality Management, IMS Unison University, to give the address note for the conference. Thank you, Dr. Ruchika. Uh, distinguished keynote speakers, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Deans and the heads of various schools, the conference delegates and the students. A very good morning to all. Uh, it gives me great pleasure and pride to welcome you to the second edition of National Interdisciplinary Conference 2022 jointly being hosted by School of Hospitality Management and School of Liberal Arts. Uh, International Women's Day is a global celebration of economic, political and social achievements of women from past, present and future. So today uh, on March 8th, uh, we mark the 111 years of first observing the International Women's Day. School of Hospitality Management and the School of Liberal Arts at IMS Union University they are celebrating the International Women's Day by hosting this national interdisciplinary conference on the very pertinent theme challenging the status quo, gendered empowerment and the change. Well, the gendered empowerment is the empowerment of people of any gender. While conventionally, uh, what we tend to believe is it is being reduced to the aspect of only women empowerment. Now, this concept also stresses the distinction between biological sex and gender as a role, and also uh, it refers to other margin marginalized genders, in particular political or social situation or context. Then uh, gender empowerment nowadays has become a significant topic of discussion regarding development and economics. The entire nations, the businesses, the communities, and the groups, they all can benefit from the implementation of this program and policies, and they can also uh, uh, adopt this notion of women empowerment. Uh, at the micro level, the goal five of the sustainable development goals focuses on the gender empowerment and participation. And it is an essential step for a country to overcome any obstacle that is associated with poverty and development. While talking about the another dimension of gendered empowerment, I would especially like to mention that in India, with the enforcement of Transgender Person Protection of Rights Act 2019, an essence of equality scheme that is enshrined are in, in our Indian constitution, it is being realized. Now, what does it state? Quote, enjoyment of life by all citizens and an equal opportunity to grow as human beings, irrespective of race, caste, religion, community, social status, and gender, unquote. Now, some of the sub-themes of this conference cover these aspects, and I believe some of the research paper that we were going through, they actually touch upon some noble uh, concept related to, uh, to this theme. Now, this uh, conference is going to serve two humble purposes. 
Number one, it will try to build uh, build the collective and common understanding for driving a change towards achievement of gender equality. And of course, through this research paper and sharing experiences through panel discussion, uh, we are going to learn the lessons and we are going to learn about the innovative approaches to overcome gender inequalities in all sectors and spheres of society. Then of course, uh, I would also like to mention one important thing. Uh, we are celebrating this conference on the International Women Day. Now the United Nation Entity for Gender Equality and Empowerment Women is also known as UN Women. And it's a United Nation Entity working for gender equality and empowerment of women. Uh, now this year, uh, UN Women or International Women's Day, they have a specific theme. It is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. And it gives a call for climate action for women by the women. Then of course, uh, the important thing of out of this theme is women and girls, they have to also bear the burden of climate impact, changes in climate, and there are also, uh, they are also essential to leading and driving changes in climate adaptation, maybe mitigation and the solutions. You see, without the inclusion of the half of the world population, I think it is unlikely that solution for sustainable planet and gender equal world, it won't be realized. Uh, I would like to share a small video message from UN Women on this theme of the International Day. Just allow me to play this small clip for you. I hope the message Earth, is now uh, visual and audio, audio also. Invaluable, but not invulnerable. Are we too late to save it? Climate change is making our world more dangerous, more fragile, more unequal. In these uncertain times, women and girls face a disproportionate threat of displacement, poverty, and violence. But women and girls are also a powerful force in climate action. As innovators in green energy. As defenders of the environment. And as educators of our generation and the next. Gender equality is not just a woman's issue. It's the path to our survival. So it's not too late to invest in climate action by and for women. Not too late to empower women entrepreneurs and decision makers at home. Not too late to give voice and power to this next generation of Earth champions. It's not too late to demand commitments to build an equal and enduring future for all. Championing climate action by and for women and girls is the key to saving our planet. Join the fight for gender equality today so that together we can create a sustainable tomorrow. It's not too late. Our speakers and the panelists at this conference are eclectic, uh, eclectic mix of the academician, practitioner, and the domain expert. Now, this should, I believe, uh, make up for the invigorating and very productive talks and sessions ahead. And definitely with this introductory remarks, I again welcome you to this conference. Over to you, Ruchika. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rana, for this comprehensive introduction to the theme of the conference. Uh, we really hope that we come accomplish all the purposes you mentioned through our interesting papers and the dialogue followed by them. 
I now invite uh, Professor Madhu Prabhakaran, Dean of School of Liberal Arts, IMS Sinison University, for the ad address note. Sir. Greetings and welcome to all. Our what we see is what we see in this world is our mentality materialized. And hence the cardinal question is. Does the status quo matches with the potential? How does what is matches with what is desired? Put in other words, does what is match with what should be? However, both these questions are quite problematic. What is is historical and contemporaneous? To state it more precisely, what is is socially constructed. What is, is the part of our mentality, discourse, common parlance, precisely that is what, that is how we perceive. Our perceptions are historically colored, deeply entrenched. Channels and trenches of our thoughts are already laid. That channel is gendered. That's what we mean by gendered. What we see, hear, speak, or think is gendered. We are possessed by gendered mentality. We are possessed irrespective of ourselves representing whatsoever gender. Most of the time, we take it for granted. Our mentality bursts into speech and action unconsciously. We own it up, and hence we do not recognize that we are possessed by alien mentality that got into us from non-local origins, such as what we have learned from our parents, peers, television, films, social media, religion, faiths, etc. Recapturing ourselves from the possession is empowerment. Do we have an Archimedes point? where we use our methodological tool to lift ourselves from the deep entrenched biases? That is the question we try to explore in the conference where we problematize our gendered mindsets. We need to problematize the homologies between biology and sociology. We need to problematize the historical entropy that has made our mentality deranged yet we imagine it to be normal. The second question is, what should be? What should be can take an ideological or idealist turn. No learned social scientist welcomes such an ideological presupposition as of now. Hence we ask, how come? We ask, how come? How come we are what we are? That is, asking the genealogy question, as Frederick Nietzsche asked, in his genealogy of morals. Methodologically, we investigate the process by which we got deluded into gendered mindset. Such an exploration is called exploration into historical ontology, the ontology that made possible by historical process. That is to trace the epistemic origins of gendered social reality. That is, we explore the structure of our mentality and trace the history of entropy. We, ex we expose it, we conceal it, expecting, we expose it, unconceal it, expecting revolution as winding, as unwinding begins, because revolution means unwinding. It is not merely a women issue, it is an issue of mentality that has been clouded, that has clouded both men and women and of all genders and let us to be bleak, bearing its burden. The gendered mentalities are to be decluttered. I believe the conference of this kind are an invitation to begin such a decluttering. I thank you once again, all of you, for listening patiently to me. Greetings to all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Prabhakaran, for this insightful introductory address. 
Next up, we would like to play a video on the theme of our conference, which gives a very brief visual glimpse of it, of what it aims to achieve. Just give me a minute. Women are self-sufficient. Women are headstrong. Women are fearless. Women are powerful. A woman with a voice. On this Women's Day 2022, IMS Unison University is excited to extend to you an invitation to attend National Interdisciplinary E-Conference on Challenging the Status Quo, Gender Empowerment and Change 2022. The conference brings together scholarship on gender issues and women in the humanities, social sciences and natural sciences. Participants will be encouraged to explore historical and current issues in transformation pertaining to gender and social justice and critically examine the methodological, academic and social concerns. It is intended to be a forum for wide range of interdisciplinary issues seen from diverse vantage points, gender, race, age, class, sexuality, ethnicity, nationality, etc. and equip participants to explore, express and debate. Get yourself registered and reserve your seats. We are looking forward to seeing you at the conference. As we saw, this conference encourages scholarships on scholarship on questions of changes and transformations with respect to gender issues. Through this forum, we strive to look at intersections of gender with race, class, sexuality, nationality and ethnicity and encourage our participants to explore, express and debate. Now I would like to invite Professor Gautam Sinha, Vice Chancellor, IMS Unison University for a special address of, for our conference. I'll uh, briefly introduce Professor Sinha. Professor Sinha has a vast experience of over 40, 43 years across industry, teaching and research. Formerly, he was the founder director at IIM Kashipur from 2012 to 2018. He has also been the director at Lal Bahadur Shastri Institute of Management, Delhi from 2011 to 12 and professor at IIT Kharagpur from 2002 to 2019. As a part of his industrial experience, he has been associated with various prestigious bodies such as Bokaro Steel Plant of Steel Authority of India and Larsen Turbo from 1979 to 2002. In the domain of research, he has several papers to his credit in international journals of repute. He has been a recipient of various awards and is an avid researcher. With a glimpse of your vast and varied experience, sir, I request you to give a special address for our conference. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Ruchika. Uh, good morning and welcome everybody, the participants of this national e-conference on challenging the status quo, gendered empowerment and change 2022. There couldn't have been a better day to have this conference. Today is Women's Day. And it's a wonderful day to discuss the gender issue. I would like to welcome our keynote speakers, Professor Nimit Chaudhary from Jamia Media Islamia and Professor Manpreet Kaur Kang, Dean of the School of Humanities, Guru Govind Singh, Hindraprastha University. Um, when we talk of these issues of gender empowerment, two concepts come to the fore and they are interrelated to human existence. They are that of gender and sex. In everyday conversation, we use these terms interchangeably. However, they are not. The World Health Organization states that sex refers to the different biological and physiological characteristics of male and females, such as the reproductive organs, the chromosomes and hormones, etc. Biologically, most human beings exist as two sexes, male and female. There is also a third sex. The third is understood to mean the other. Anyone who does not fall into the category of these two sexes is called the third sex or the third gender. The World Health Organization also notes that gender is a social construct. 
It is the socially constructed characteristics of men and women, such as norms and roles, the relationships between groups of men and women. It varies from society to society and can be changed. Gender, unlike sex, encompasses a person's identity, expression, societal roles. And gender is also a personal preference. A person may choose a gender that is different from his or her natal sex or the sex that he was born with, he or she was born with. Whenever an individual or group does not fit into the established gender norms, they face uh, gender norms, they face stigma, discrimination, even social exclusion, all of which affects their mental and physical health. Gendered is a technical term with a very specific meaning. Gendered refers to deeply embedded mentalities by which the meanings of being a man or a woman in different societies and times are configured and reconfigured. The objective of such studies as ours is to unconceal the deep-seated biases that operate in our minds and almost become second nature. I mean, in our generation, for example, a girl who played a robust game like football and probably preferred to have a short hair and a no-nonsense style was labeled a tomboy. So these are almost uh, deeply imprinted in our minds and uh, we look at the world through these gendered paradigms. The gendered biases are myriad and, and attach almost every aspect of our life. Uh, as an engineer, I can tell you, automobile designers ignore the physiology and anatomy of females while designing car seats and even seat belts. The pharmacological researchers resort to disproportionate representation of men in their drug trial, and the list is endless. So unconcealing these deep-seated biases is a prerequisite to empowerment. Unless we understand what binds us, we cannot free ourselves. So empowerment means opening the untapped potential by removing the barriers. So I hope that this conference first identifies the, the, the ropes that bind us, these ropes of gender thinking that bind us. And only then when we uh, understand what they are, can we liberate ourselves. So. In this conference, let us explore the gendered biases, the processes and the structures that block us. I must thank the School of Liberal Arts and the School of Hospitality Management for organizing this National Knee Conference on this very nuanced but relevant topic. I hope the deliberations will result in exposing the biases and barriers to empowerment. And I welcome all the participants again. And our guests, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for this uh, thought provoking address, sir. I think you have touched upon some very significant issues here, which we can explore later in our discussions today. Thank you. We uh, now move on to our keynote speakers for the conference. We thank you for joining us today. Our first keynote speaker is uh, Professor uh, Nimit Chaudhary. Dr. Nimit Chaudhary is a professor and ex head of the Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management at Jamia Millia Islamia Central University. He has more than 28 years of academic experience. He has been a full professor for 15 years. Earlier, he has taught at the Indian Institute of Tourism and Travel Management, Mizoram University, Jivaji University, and Maharshi Dayanand Saraswati University. Apart from these, he has also taught in universities in China, Mexico, Sweden, Spain, and Slovenia. He is a recipient of various awards and scholarships, such as uh, AICTE Career Award for Young Teachers, SIDA Fellowship Sweden, Erasmus Mundus Europe, among others. He was also chosen for the prestigious LEAP program at Oxford University. He has authored eight books, edited five books, and has contributed more than 155 papers. We welcome you, sir. Thank you for joining us today. We request you to start. Thank you, Ruchika. Uh, first and foremost, uh, <clears throat> And let me record my appreciation for the university 
especially the School of Hospitality Management and School of Liberal Arts for having me here. And uh, a very good morning to Professor Sidha, Professor Rana, Professor Madhukar, uh, Madhu Prabhakar uh, my co-panelist today, Professor Manpreet, uh, gentlemen and all the wonderful ladies in the audience today. Uh, please allow me to use my PPT. Is it visible, Ruchika? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay. So let me begin by wishing a very happy International Women's Day to one and all. And uh, let me also start with a disclaimer uh, that, uh, uh, or uh, yeah, kind of a disclaimer that I didn't really uh, thought of. Uh, uh, I had an opinion. We've been discussing this, these issues, but as an academic, as a serious researcher, I have never dwelt into uh, these issues of gender. Uh, and so, you know, I was not, uh, I was not quite very sure that what uh, should I be speaking and where is the challenge. And as we normally do, I started with uh, throwing this question, this issue to my group, my department, uh, where we have some very accomplished colleagues and some very talented young researchers. Of course, uh, many of them are girls. I said, what do you mean uh, or what do you think of this issue? And then there was a ravaging and, you know, uh, high decibel debate uh, in the department. And uh, three key words that came out of this were, of course, feminism, and the other two words, which were other two terms, constructs, which were related to feminism. One were the rights, and uh, the other was empowerment. So most of the participants in this debate were more concerned about rights, empowerment, and obviously under the larger umbrella of feminism. So that led me to, you know, try to uncover what exactly is the state of uh, this issue, more so in India. And so I started looking for it and I came across this research by you, Research Center. A couple of good findings which I thought I would share with you before pitching in for tourism and hospitality as a probable, you know, um, answer or a probable solution to the challenge that we're trying to address. Uh, in this part of the world, and um, while it says uh, talks about uh, the opinion of men and women in India, uh, this whole concept of Nari Shakti is very indigenous. It's uh, very, you know, ingrained into the South Asian psyche. And if you remember, and if you recall, the first ever elected head of the state in the entire world came from this region and she was Shrima Bandar Naikeji. 1960s, she was elected. She led her party to an electoral victory and she became the prime minister of uh, Sri Lanka. But it's not only Sri Lanka or India, you know, India and Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan on the other side, we've all had women leading our uh, nations, our country, and this is exactly what is reflected in the sentiment. Then nearly three-fourths uh, of uh, adults in India uh, believe that both women and men should have a greater say. So my idea was like, does is it a really big concern and how do people, especially in our country, think about it? And that is where I'm running through these uh, you know, uh, bits uh, of research. Then four in 10 Indians say that it is acceptable to balance gender makeup of a family via modern methods. So look at the kind of uh, change, you know, conventionally, there's idea that this is what is happening. 
But look at what's uh, being felt and what is being agreed upon and what is being endorsed by an evolving India. And this research is between 1920, huh? November 2019 to March 2020. Then look at the conventional roles. This is how the Indian population or the Indian, uh, we Indians uh, look at some of those issues about who has the primary responsibility for the parents last right or who is who should be the primary earning member and who should take care of the family and things like that. Another issue that uh, is very important and uh, we, a lot of us uh, talk about this, is uh, the men's or the, so, you know, the way they are disposed of towards women and women issues and this whole concept of boys not respecting. So even this was like investigated and almost 76% uh, uh, of the respondents, three fourths of them said that violence against women is a very, very big problem. So at least there is an acknowledgement to this. And uh, about half of uh, the Indians say that it is very important to teach boys to respect women. And roughly, you know, half of that number say that it is more important to teach girls to behave properly. So that's just the finding. Then the conventional idea of uh, family and marriage. So in India, we still have like around 46% uh, uh, 40 percent of uh, Indians who say that marriage is traditional gender roles. So there's a role assigned to males and females, uh, the two genders within the family. And we still have this idea, this notion of, you know, going by the roles that have been assigned to us. But as one of my predecessor, one of the speakers before me said, that women are half the society. You cannot have a revolution without women. You cannot have democracy without women. You cannot have equality without women. And you cannot have anything without women. So what is the status of uh, women? Women, you know, are half of world's population working two thirds of the world's working hours receiving 10% of the world's income, owning less than 1% of the world's property. So whatever Q's research suggests, whatever we feel that we are evolving, there's a distinct and a definite shift in our mindsets, the way we are looking at this issue. The hard fact is that, look at this graphic, which says that women are still disadvantaged and COVID and um, the professor referred to climate change, but we've been through and we're almost through, God willing, through this pandemic. But COVID has had its own impact on this divide. And uh, look at some of the effects. Poverty is rising and because of uh, the COVID and women are more vulnerable. 55% of the women with newborns receive no maternity cash benefits. Food security is on the rise with more women and girls going hungry. 10% higher levels of hunger than men in 2020. That's right, uh, in between, uh, right as we were through this pandemic. Half of all the refugee girls enrolled in school, it is uh, estimated, will not return to school after the pandemic is over. And so that's really worrying for us. Uh, COVID has also intensified women's uh, workload at home. They have spent, it's estimated, 31 hours per week on child care. So that's an extra burden that has been put on her. And women have suffered steeper job losses than men. 54 million women have lost their job in 2020 and 45 million have left the job market for 
I mean, I'm not going to return to this market. So, uh, how does it reflect? Is unequal decision making, uh, you know, in positions of power? Say, for example, globally, there's just one in four parliamentary seats uh, that are held by women. So, look how women are actually placed. Good that we started thinking on those lines. I understand what some of my predecessors say that it has to be the empowerment of both the genders and everything, all good things. But here are some hard facts. And that is why the theme for uh, very aptly, the theme for this year's uh, International Women Day is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. Sustainability is one of the superordinate goals that the entire humanity is trying to pursue. So where do we stand? What's going to be the way forward? One, I'm talking about uh, sustainable development goals and sustainable development, and especially in tourism, we've been talking a lot about sustainability and responsibility and uh, mindfulness and consumption and all those things because we want to have a happier, healthier planet. So where, what's the way forward? Improving the human development, removing constraints for more and better jobs. Some people are by default disadvantaged and so those uh, constraints have to be removed. Removing barriers to women's ownership and control over assets. That's a real worry thing. I mean, even during the discussion in my department on the subject, uh, I mean, these are, uh, you know, ladies who are either in advanced stage of their research, so they've had quite an opportunity for education or their faculty in the department, but still one of the uh, concerns that stood out was, you know, uh, access to assets and, you know, right on assets and property. So this was an important issue. And enhancing women's voice and agency. Now, this, what I said, uh, what I spoke about or what I talked about was what we are thinking, how are women placed, what should be done, who does it and how do we do it. So as a scholar or as a student of tourism, uh, I want to take some time to pitch in the role of uh, tourism in what we are planning to do and what we intend to do. So, in most regions of the world, women make up for the majority of tourism workforce. So that is how tourism deals with women. Women tend to be concentrated in lowest paid and lowest status jobs in tourism. So that is something that needs to be changed. Women perform a large amount of unpaid work in family tourism business. So tourism is all about, you know, by nature, by default tourism or the uh, good thing about tourism is that it's not only about creation of wealth, it also lends a helping hand to equitable distribution of wealth. So tourism is all over the place. It's a smaller firms. It's a smaller operations. You know, a lot of people at the bottom of the pyramid are involved in tourism, which also includes a lot of women. So a lot of families, a lot of women, you know, come up and they do start. Even in your state of Uttarakhand, I know because I'm associated with a couple of projects that. Uh, Tourism is being used as a mechanism, as an intervention for women empowerment, for make, you know, for you know, creating an agency where women are heard and women are represented. And women constitute more than half of those employed in accommodation and food service sectors. So just five you know, important uh, uh, things or important uh, interventions of tourism uh, for this uh, women empowerment. One, uh, tourism provides decent work for women. The gender pay gap is narrower in tourism than in, it is 
in any other sector or the average uh, in terms of uh, global economy. Uh, ILO found out that women make up for 60 to 70 percent of the labor force in the hotel sector. Of course, and the disclaimer is that uh, there are a lot of regional variations, but uh, in spite of that. Second is entrepreneurship. Um, as I mentioned earlier, women make up for majority of self-employed workforce in the economy, but they do not make up the majority of the self-employed workforce in tourism. So tourism more needs to be done. They work more, they contribute more, their labor is more in tourism, but still the ownership and you know the opportunity for starting up is somehow restricted and shrinked. On the other hand, we have this example from Nicaragua and Panama, where 70% of business owners in tourism are women compared to just 15 other sectors. So that gives us some hope the direction in which perhaps we could be moving. Third is how do you empower? And as an academic, uh, you know, my best bet is teaching and training and learning. Uh, it has been realized that women have fewer opportunities for higher level tourism and training that are critical for career progression. And this is something that must be changed. This is one of the important interventions that could actually empower women. So more so in tourism, we are all set for, you know, more learning and training opportunities for women and girls. Um, I can just uh, come in to say that uh, a lot of schemes of the Ministry of Tourism, Government of India, which are focused to skills, uh, you know, skill enhancement, skill enhancement and uh, you know, training of uh, workforce, more so of women uh, who want to you know, be part of this uh, tourism sector. The fourth important thing is leadership, policy and decision making. Women need to have a say. So female leadership in tourism across the private and public sector is higher than the average, but uh, women remain substantially underrepresented as leaders. Say, for example, if we're talking about, uh, you know, top 500 com tourism companies in the world. So if you look at that space, women are underrepresented, but it's gradually decreasing and this must increase. Women are more likely to have a leadership voice in tourism businesses, associations and tourism governance than in other arenas. And finally, the last intervention is community and civil society. Tourism affects the life of women uh, women living in tourism destinations, whether or not they are tourism workers. So the kind of impact that tourism has, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, spur that uh, tourism activities add to a local economy at the ground level, at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, that uh, empowers a lot of women and therefore tourism is a very, very welcome uh, you know, intervention for women empowerment. So uh, these were, uh, you know, these are five broad directions in which tourism fraternity is thinking, uh, contemplating and, you know, trying to empower uh, women because we understand, we realize that uh, we cannot have a better world, a better place to live where half of these uh, I mean, the humanity is not uh, taken into account or if uh, they feel that they are being left out. But then uh, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And so a woman should be two things as they famously or as they popularly say, who and what she wants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nimit, for this engaging keynote address. I think your address uh, has set a precedent for the rest of the presentations today to critically engage with the ideas of uh, gender stereotypes, interlinkages of uh, gender with economy, unpaid work, as you mentioned, 
and politics and the idea of agency which you also mentioned for with respect to women i think it has also left us with a lot of possible interventions and future directions to think about uh, specifically in the sector of tourism thank you so much sir thank you Rishi. thank you i now welcome uh, professor manpreet to join us as our uh, keynote speaker for the conference i would uh, like to introduce her briefly first uh, Professor Manpreet has teaching and research experience of 26 years, which includes teaching at both uh, graduate and undergra undergraduate levels. She has been teaching at Guru Gobind Singh Indraprasth University since 2005. Uh, she has four books and 14 research papers to her credit and is an editor of a journal. She is the ex-president of IASA, that is International American Studies Association and secretary Mello, which is multi-ethnic literatures of the world. She was also a Shastri Fellow at the Department of English, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada from 2009 to 10. Her major areas of interest include women's studies, gender studies, uh, American literature and writing of the Indian diaspora. We welcome you, ma'am. Thanks for joining us today. We request you to take over. Thank you, Ruchika, and thank you for this uh, uh, very kind introduction. Um, good morning to everyone present here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank IMS Unison University for inviting me and giving me this forum to present and uh, share my views with you all. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and uh, welcome and uh, greet the Vice Chancellor, Professor Gautam Singha, uh, the conveners, Professor Rana, Professor Prabhakaran, and uh, all the other faculty members, participants, uh, and presenters at the conference. Good morning. And uh, you know, today we are here to discuss uh, a topic which is really close to my heart, has always been, which is, well, if I may say, used to be earlier, you know, women's studies, but I would say women's studies has uh, grown to be more inclusive. And therefore now, uh, you know, the larger umbrella term of gender studies. Um, and very rightly, the, I was happy to see that the conference is titled Gendered Empowerment and Change, and not only women's empowerment. Though today, the day is International Women's Day. And this is not to uh, undermine the uh, <clears throat> long journey we still have for, to go uh, towards women's empowerment. And, and I think, in fact, Professor Chaudhary's uh, presentation was really uh, reinforcing the fact that we sometimes believe and we tend to believe that we've come a long way. But statistics really don't show that. And that is sad. The reality is reflected to the statistics. But definitely, uh, the, the title of the conference itself tells us that we that somewhere things need to change. Uh, challenging the status quo. Things are not as they should be. Um, coming from the field of literature uh, and also where women's empowerment really started with the feminist movement, I will not go into the technicalities and theoretical uh, premises of that uh, particularly, but I do want to highlight that literature has played a, a great role in highlighting uh, women's issues, gender issues, and when we look at gender empowerment, uh, women's, I mean, you know, women's, the women's movement or feminism was the starting point. And uh, uh, I would just like to draw attention, not particularly to the women's issues. We have, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the theorists of the first and second wave movements, uh, but I do want to draw attention to the close of the second wave of the feminist movement, uh, where um, the criticism against the second wave was that it was not inclusive. It was primarily uh, middle class, uh, white centered, you know, it, it raised the issues and addressed the issues only of uh, the middle class white women. And therefore, the whole uh, concept of which uh, have has been spoken of by uh, Ruchika and others about the intersectionality, which is very important, and the criticism against the uh, second wave feminist uh, theorists was that they were not looking at issues of class and 
gender, alternative genders, though again, alternative uh, might not be the best term to use, which again otherizes. Like the vice chancellor said, the moment we say alternative or we talk of the third gender, we are again in a way categorizing and labeling as not within the norm. So that is where, and in India we have uh, probably many other intersections, but primarily the major one being caste. So uh, a person's identity, a person's experience uh, stems from uh, the intersectionality of all these factors. So uh, looking at gender alone sometimes is not really uh, good enough. Uh, that is something I also wanted to draw attention to. And very rightly as pointed out by the Vice Chancellor, you know, we, when we say gender, uh, we usually think of men and women. Uh, we need to start thinking uh, in a more inclusive way. We have now man, woman and trans huh? or the transgender, which is a large umbrella term uh, which uh, includes uh, various various genders, gender identities, and um, in fact, sometimes you know, day-to-day -day real life experiences uh, make you start thinking. Recently, I was traveling, you know, and in the airlines and the flights, they always announce, uh, "Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen." Now they started saying, uh, "Boys and girls." But I was wondering, why do we need to? Uh, we just say, "Good morning, everyone." You know, which is so more so much more inclusive instead of saying, okay, men, women, tomorrow we'll say, okay, transgenders. These categories and, uh, you know, boundaries, we need to start looking beyond. And in fact, recent gender theorists talk of the continuum versus the very uh, binary of the patriarchal uh, structure, which was very, very uh, rigid. You fall either on one side of the spectrum or the other. And all those traits or characteristics which are which are relevant to one gender, then you you have to strictly uh, try to stay within them. And therefore, we had the feminine and the masculine trap. So uh, uh, to think of the continuum where anybody can fall anywhere within uh, that continuum, you don't have to always be conscious that you are uh, a man or a woman or a trans and need to behave or dress or in a particular manner, or you would be. Uh, you know, not seen as probably within the norm. Um, well, uh, a little bit more about the patriarchal system a little later on. I would like to also talk about what empowerment really stands for. And uh, uh, very rightly, as mentioned by the earlier speakers, empowerment entails decision making, access to decision making, uh, very importantly, economic freedom and access to opportunities, example, education and professions and a lifestyle. And uh, this can happen only when we redefine gender roles. And uh, like somebody mentioned, women do not need to be empowered as long as the barriers and the attitudes towards women are changed. Women are strong, capable of empowering themselves, provided they are allowed to do so. They are uh, not hampered, you know, the empowerment would, would follow. Um, looking at a patriarchy as a system um, is something a little bit I would want to talk about. Um, you know, how a patriarchy is to be understood as not necessarily only men. It is a system which has been um, primarily male centered or male dominated, but is uh, taken forward by both men and women. Women have internalized patriarchy and they often, therefore, we hear, you know, of, of terms like or things like women are, you know, their worst enemies, each other's worst enemies. And that is what is played out a lot when we go back and see when we look at literature or fairy tales or children's poems. We have the stepmothers, we have the witches and we have, you know, women competing for male attention uh, and so on. And uh, so patriarchy is a system which is detrimental to both men and women because we have the masculine trap and the feminine trap and transgression and how this system has stayed in place so long is because transgressions are rewarded or punished, rewarded with, for example, glorification. Women's sacrifice has always been glorified. Men's valor is glorified. Um, 
and ostracism could be one form of punishment. Labeling women as immoral, the first step towards immediately trying to cut down uh, an ambitious or a powerful woman. Um, and when we talk about theorists, we have certain debates within feminism leading on towards uh, queer theory. And I would like to point out a couple of important points here. Um, the women's movement after the 80s did open up to become more inclusive. Uh, you know, masculinity started to be spoken about somewhere around the 80s. We had ecofeminism, where the concerns of the environment, not only environment, even, uh, you know, uh, animals or all living beings started to be addressed. And it was realized and felt, as pointed by some of the speakers, that by addressing or speaking within women's group groups or addressing only women's concerns, one is looking at only, well, almost only half, half of the population. Women's ideas may change, but what about men? We need to address men's issues. We need to address men to sensitize them to women's issues. And so that, you know, uh, it's a more, there is a dialogue and not a confrontation. And the word feminism had become so um, almost like a word to be looked down upon. Some of the young students will say, well, they do not want to be labeled feminists because feminist was made out to be something, uh, you know, man hating, a shrill, shrieking women, uh, home destroying, whereas all the political standpoint of feminism implied was equal opportunity for everybody. And um, so the debate I was talking about, we had theorists like Adrian Rich and Judith Butler who moved on from being feminist to uh, gender theorists or also speaking of the concerns of the queer. The major point of difference, which uh, the vice chancellor also pointed out, was that the feminist movement believed that gender is a construct. That, and uh, Simon de Beauvoir's very well-known quote, uh, a woman, one is not born a woman, but becomes one. Uh, and the whole uh, theoretical premise of the women's movement is that we have two genders and the masculine overpowers, dominates or marginalizes the female gender. The queer theorists believe that sex is also a construct. And that's the point of difference. Queer theorists believe that sex is also a construct there, there is a possibility between only the male and the female sex. It is intersex is the term given to all those human beings who do not fall in the male and the female physiological, male and female implying more the physiological, whereas man and woman implying more the gender. And so the debates between and with this uh, theory of queer feminists that sex is also a construct, the feminists, uh, their debate seemed to lose uh, its relevance. And so there were a lot of debates and counter debates. Another well-known theorist, Eve Kosowski Sedgwick, uh, you know, so fight the, the, some of the recent debates have veered towards being more uh, inclusive and um, uh, accepting of both debates, understanding that, well, we may look at the queer as well as the women as um, marginalized, as disadvantaged and needing special attention. And instead of fighting or arguing or debating within themselves, uh, they collectively need to work towards the betterment of all marginalized groups. Uh, also within gender debates, you know, we have in recent uh, times, we have um, a lot of focus towards the possibility of a genderless society or science fiction, or some of you must be familiar with Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, where uh, genders and sexes are uh, possible to be controlled and determined uh, the way uh, one would want as functions. Or moving beyond, we also have 
Donna Haraway's concepts of the cyborg, for example, you know, which is um, uh, science and technology and, and gender coming together. But well, these are all uh, fictions and fictive and future possibilities and all the debates which go with them coming back to the real world like uh, very well presented by Professor Jodhuri, the reality is so very different. The reality is still that we have we are a very biased world. We are biased when it comes to gender issues and we need to work towards that. And COVID has highlighted how, uh, you know, women have borne the brunt in terms of uh, in every in every way, whether it is the work or it is economic independence or losing work or putting in extra work. And uh, within India, we have a lot of focus now in re-looking, re-understanding, reinterpreting our Indian systems, uh, look at reinterpreting gender from and also looking at myth, mythological characters like Sita Draupadi. We have recently a lot of literature coming where the woman's viewpoint is being looked at and how that can be uh, can help in understanding or bringing black back the glory which the initial uh, video played from the Rig Ved seems to suggest that women possibly probably had a better position in society. Definitely attitudes towards the trans were more acceptable uh, in earlier times. If we go back to our myths, mythology, if we go back to our temple carvings, we go back to uh, there is a very um, uh, large or ramped mention of trance, of genders. We have Shikhandi, we have so many characters and it was not seen as uh, an abnorm, so to say. And uh, but like the world over, you know, it's a very beautiful book, Genders by um, David Glover and Cora Kaplan, when they talk about how femininity, masculinity, as well as the queer have changed over the concepts and attitudes towards them have changed over time in different cultures, different geographical locations, highlighting, of course, also the fact that it is not something which is inborn, innate, a given. It is something which changes over time. And attitudes towards men, women, and the trans have changed a lot over time. There were times when the world society culture was more accepting of women or trans who are now the larger uh, disadvantaged groups, though which does not mean that all men are advantaged, uh, but yet they were disadvantaged and there have been times that there was more acceptance and times when there is less acceptance. Uh, in fact, uh, I also wanted to uh, comment on when uh, Professor Chaudhary is telling us about the tourism industry. I think this is just one example. It is very the same statistics will reflect in all areas of um, professions uh, or in any field, uh, whether it is uh, tourism or whether it is education or whether it is, uh, you know, uh, engineering or you can speak of any career. The positions of power are always or largely held by men and the supporting roles are largely held by women. And I'm glad he showed the statistics because usually when you say that, people will say, oh no, things have changed. You know, and examples are given of world leaders or uh, world CEOs, but that is tokenism. Those are just a very small percentage. And that is something which we need to understand because usually women or feminists or gender theorists, anybody working towards empowerment are told that things have changed. Let's stop this sobbing and crying now. We now we have, you know, now everybody's equal. But the statistics don't show that. In fact, I was reminded of a text we were discussing in class just two days ago. Mahesh Dattani, the famous playwrights, Dance Like a Man. Even those fields where a large number of women are the workforce or practitioners for dance. Indian traditional dance forms, particularly Bharatanatyam, which was discussed in this text. 
the, the I was discussing with the students how even those fields where women are the uh, the the workers, the position of power and control usually rests with the men. All the dance gurus, the dance gharanas were always led by men. And similarly, women at you know day to day, women are the ones who will be the cooks at home. But when it comes to professional, you know, chefs, usually you have men. And similarly, one can go on so and so forth in, in every arena. Wherever you find positions of power have been claimed by men and women relegated always to the, uh, you know, lower jobs or the supporting roles. Well, things are changing for sure. That is heartening. But I think we have a long way to go. And a conference like this one, where hopefully, uh, you know, the large list of possible topics which is mentioned uh, will be debated and discussed will go a long way towards making us think discuss and debate these issues because that is the way forward by by critiquing or by uh, blaming or labeling we may not progress now being a literature person well uh, before i conclude i would like to quote a few lines which speak of either women's urge for empowerment or, or just claiming the empowerment and trying to um, underplay the very biased attitudes towards women, their bodies, uh, or their, their feelings and thoughts. Uh, one of these poems is In Celebration of My Uterus by Anne Sexton, uh, written somewhere around the 60s, I would say. Uh, I'm just quoting one stanza from here. Sweet wait in celebration of the woman I am and of the soul of the woman I am and of the central creature and its delight, I sing for you. I dare to live. Hello, spirit. Hello, cup. Fasten cover. Cover that does contain. Hello to the soil of the fields. Welcome roots. Uh, another very powerful voice is Maya Angelou, though of course her voice is a woman's voice, but also a black woman's voice. She's an American, black American poet. I'm sure you all familiar with her. Uh, so uh, her lines and this poem, Still I Rise, I'd like to quote a few lines here. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes surging high, still I'll rise. And uh, just a few more lines, um, which uh, is, you know, a Punjabi poet, just Beer Kaur. I translated some of her poetry, and she had picked up, uh, uh, you know, uh, mythological women characters. And uh, this poem is about Urvashi, the Apsara. And as you all know, the Apsaras uh, were the most, uh, you know, they were the ones who were uh, dancers to entice, often uh, entice or uh, uh, enrapture uh, the powerful men. And uh, Urvashi was the most beautiful and the, exp and the expert dancer. And this is uh, the interpretation of the poet about Urvashi's dance. The woman laughs without the veil of modesty. She roars with laughter. If you don't want to listen, then listen to this truth also. My dance is not for your pleasure. My dance was a search for myself. My dance was my wrath, was my hatred. And now it is my strength. With this, I'd like to end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Manpreet, for this enlightening keynote address. I think it has very well underlined how we can delineate the deeply entrenched gender binaries in literature and, of course, beyond, and how we can promote inclusivity across all genders. Especially the, token, the tokenistic approach you mentioned towards all of this is so commonplace and reinforced today. We surely need to question that. And you also mentioned some very, some really great works which intrigue me personally to explore. I thank you on behalf of all of us for enlightening us. 
we extend our gratitude for the keynote for, for the keynote speech. I think it was a very uh, all in all. I think it was a very enriching session which will enable us to expand our horizons in our reflections on gender empowerment. With this, we approach the end of this session. I thank you all for joining this session. We are really thankful to you. Um, I would now request you all to switch on your cameras if possible for a group uh, virtual photo. Please allow us a minute. Thank you so much. I request you all to join the next session of this conference now, the link for which has already been shared with you. This is the technical session we have uh, where we have all the presenters. It starts at 11 for, uh, 11.45. We really hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nimit, and thank you, Dr. Manpreet. And thank you, Vishisad.